So, I've already kind of introduced myself. I'm a storyteller, I'm a civic activator, um, I'm a community collaborator, and I am nothing compared to the panelists joining me today. Oh my god, like, you'll, you'll, you'll meet them in a second, they're incredible. So, I'm so excited to introduce you all to them. I'm gonna start with Mariana on my left. Um, Mariana is a senior information architect at Johnson & Johnson, serving the global marketing activation team in the consumer health sector. Passionate about community and culture, she volunteers as the YYC Data Society sponsorship manager and creative curator, where she focuses on partnering with like-minded organizations and elevating and empowering diverse voices in the community through engaging experiences. As co-organizer for Women in Data Calgary, Mariana helps enable a safe space and an opportunity for equality and inclusion to be centerfold. She is also passionate about consulting digital marketing for business leaders who align and support her values. Welcome, Mariana. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Can you um, tell us a little bit about, thank you, um, what brings you here? What brings you into this conversation? Um, and how are you feeling? Hi, Tommy. Thank you so much for being here today. And thank you, everyone, for lending some of your time to this conversation. I'm here today because, um, as Tommy mentioned, I am part of the conference planning committee, but at the same time, this is very personally important to me, and I'm very excited for these women to be joining here today and sharing some of her experiences. As she mentioned, these are issues that affect all of us and that benefit some of us and even us inclusive. So I think this is a great intersection for us to have in Calgary at this point in time where data science is erupting. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity to invite everyone in the audience, not just women, but men and others, to say what they think and give feedback. And again, this is about moving from inclusion to influence, and I personally believe that we all have influence. So I'm excited to get into that today. And thank you so much for being here. Amazing. Thank you, Mariana. Um, next up, we have Sherry. So Sherry is an award-winning author, speaker, and advocate. Since creating Informed Opinions in 2010, she has trained and motivated thousands of women to share their insights from the podium and through print, online, and broadcast commentary. Previously, she wrote a weekly newspaper column, produced a TV series, and performed regular commentary for CBC Radio and TV. She also taught communications at two BC universities and served as press secretary to a provincial premier. Her advocacy work has been recognized with the Governor General's Award in commemoration of the person's case and awards from Women of Influence and the Top 100 Most Powerful Women. Oh my God. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you. Um, what brings you into this conversation? The work that Informed Opinions and that I've done over the last really 30 years in aggregate has focused on understanding the supreme benefits that come from diversity and inclusion, particularly as it re refers to women's contribution. And so I'm not a tech person, but I'm really happy to be able to bring the benefits and the insights from the research and the lived experience that I've had in doing the work that we're doing, talking about really how everybody uh, benefits when women's voices are effectively integrated. Amazing, thank you so much. We're so excited to hear from you. All right, next up we have Kylie. Kylie is the founder of Sheep Geek, a nonprofit committed to building gender diversity in technology. Through its career pathing initiative, Sheep Geek helps intermediate women in technology achieve greater career visibility and invest in their strategic professional networks. During her time at Sheep Geek, Kylie has grown a community of over 14,000 women and supporters, profiled over 400 women as role models in technology, and hosted over 130 events to create connection for women in tech. Kylie is an Avenue Magazine Top 40 Under 40, has been recognized as one of Calgary's heroes by Metro News, and has received an Outstanding Alumni Achievement Award from her alma mater. 
She sits on a variety of advisory committees to support her community, ranging from post-secondaries, nonprofits, industry associations, and government. Welcome, Kylie. Um, what brings you into this conversation today? You know, I've been working in this space for almost 10 years now, advocating for women in technology, and I love to see it as part of this conversation in, in DataCon today. I think it is, you know, when we start to see these types of conversations in all pockets, it really means that we are making work and, and making some progress here. So I think that's a big win. Um, but, you know, we've done a lot of research at Sheet Geek. We also know that women are leaving technology uh, at a very quick rate, uh, at an intermediate stage in their careers, and there's still a lot of problems that we have to solve. It's going to take all of us involved in that conversation in order to make some change. So I'm excited to have the conversation. Thanks, Tommy. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kylie. All right, next up we have Anna. So Anna is an organizational psychologist and executive coach with more than 20 years of international experience in the design and implementation of corporate strategy and communications. However, it was research and the design and delivery of cu curricula for universities and organizations across Europe that comprised her primary career focus. Anna has worked with a wide variety of industries such as IT, environment, municipal planning, academia, finance, and medicine, just to name a few. In addition to ghostwriting for big fours such as KPMG, Deloitte, and PwC, she has also provided strategic and tactical support for nonprofits and startups. She is the strategic communication specialist for Bitwise M&M database consulting and works with more than a dozen IT firms in the New York metropolitan area. Welcome, Anna. What brings you to this conversation today? So many things I actually had to make notes. <laughs> but I think the, the, the main draw is that we, we are all data. I mean, it's not just who's involved in data or to what extent, which are also really important things to talk about, but we all supply data on a daily basis, whether it's our location or how we shop. And so it's an important part of social science. And as a psychologist, it's an important part of how we live our lives, how we do our jobs. And uh, recently I was thinking, you know, most of my, most of my clients are, well, you know what, let me just step that back. All of my clients are men, and all of them are CTOs uh, or beginning startups. So, you know, they're sort of solopreneurs who are trying to spread their wings and, and scale up. And I thought, you know, why is that? Why, why do they seek the voice of someone who's so, so different than, than themselves? So, I think that's a good segue into our conversation. Amazing. I'm so excited to dive in, and I just realized very unprofessionally that I have no way of keeping time. So if anyone has like a phone or something, just let me know when we're at like something, and I'll do something about it, stop talking or something. Um, I'm really, really excited to dive into this conversation. As you can see, we have an absolutely stacked panel, and um, yeah, it's going to be so good. So let's dive in. Um, obviously, we know we're talking about moving from inclusion to that's, that's what this conversation is about. So I think we can all agree that influence has a lot more of a kind of powerful, actionable feel um, than inclusion, just, at, just as a word. Um, but there are so many ways to look at and understand influence. You know, we can think about it in terms of a structural position of influence. You know, do I hold a managerial or director position in my organization? Uh, but there's also other ways of thinking about influence, and Mariana, you mentioned in your introduction, you think everybody has influence. Um, so I'm curious to hear from all of you, of, in your experience, what does real influence feel like or look like? Um, how can you identify real influence when you see it? Let's start here and we'll work down. Thank you, Tommy. For me, real influence and how I take it is when you say real, to me that translates to truthful, deliberate, intentional action. So when I say that everybody has the power to enact influence, I feel that that is something that we inherently carry within ourselves and that the way that we communicate and relate to one another is that influence coming through. It may not be that you have a managerial position in your job, but even in how you conduct yourself, I think it translates to your principles and to say, do I treat people with kind and respect? 
am I this type of person who wants to see equality, who is going to stand up for myself because when I'm standing up for myself, I'm doing so for like-minded people, for other women, for others. So for me, it extends far beyond just in the industry, but in every other aspect of my life. And outside of being a woman in tech, to say this is the type of person that I want to be, and if these are my principles, they have to be through every aspect of my life. Uh, I'm going to take a macro focus because the work that we do is really about that and influence ultimately what we're paying attention to is how it translates into action, which you mentioned. And so women or uh, equity deserving communities who are um, at the table but not heard or their ideas aren't acted on, um, that's not the kind of influence that really makes a difference. So in my definition of influence is about do the insights that everybody at the table or in the room or in the organization get acted on? Do they have an opportunity to influence outcomes? That's a really good place to measure influence. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I also, you know, want to remember, remind us that influence is not a solo game. It is a team sport. So influence is also the people around you. And I got some really great advice from a mentor recently, and he said, Kylie, it's not actually about your network. It's not your network that matters, but who is talking about you? And that was a very different way to think about who's in my network and who's talking about me. He said, the people who are talking about you are way more influential than the people you have in your network. And it was another layer of thinking about who, who is on my team, who is advocating for me and my beliefs and ideas, the changes I want to move forward. So I think influence is also about who's talking about you, your work, your ideas, and helping to move those things forward with you. Uh, this is uh, sort of, um, it highlights the, the difference between structure and agency. So if you think of it from a dialectical perspective, and a dialectic is not two sides of the same coin. A dialectic is sort of like the yin-yang symbol. So you have structure on one hand, which could be society's structure or your company's structure. In how far does that structure allow you to take agency, but also within yourself, then how do you exercise agency? So in terms of influence, it's, it's a dialectic between structure and agency. So society's structures, your own inner psychological structures. And then agency, in how far is their collective agency, whether it's marching on the streets or deciding to take an in initiative in your, in your company, um, or, or the, the kinds of agency that you take for, for yourself. So there's, there's always this dialectical relationship that happens between structure and agency, between what we're able to do ourselves and how we leverage the structures around us in order to be able to do that. I'm hearing a bit of a theme of, yeah, this, this this structure, this network, I mean, this concept of um, influence being a team sport. I love that. And so I guess I'm wondering if we were, we can't do it ourselves. Um, we, we need a support, we need a network. So if we're relying on larger structures and larger communities in order to um, make change happen, I guess my next question is, are we ready? And are our systems ready? When we look around at our team, are we ready to do this? I mean, I think, I'm sure it's no surprise. I'm sure we've all been in positions where, you know, we hear an organization or somebody talking about EDI and it's, it's more of a smokescreen. It's really, um, you know, they're looking to solve a PR problem. It's very performative. And so from your perspectives in your various roles, um, when you look at the different industries you're in, do you think that we're ready for this conversation? That we're ready to, um, yeah, enact real influence and, and support one another in doing that? Um, I'm looking at you, Anna, so I'll start with you. And then whoever has thoughts, just jump in. Are we ready for this conversation? I think we're having it. We're having it, right? And, and we're having it on so many different levels. And, and I think it's easy to, to sort of be damning about the, the performative aspects of DEI. 
Um, and, and one of them, I was super happy when you brought that up about the land acknowledgement. Here we are, we, you know, we do our little speech about the land acknowledgement. I would love to see an ind indigenous woman up here. Right? So how do we do inclusion? It's just by, 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 by thinking about what, what are the opportunities for influence from these different points of, of view. And already I forgot the question. Tell me the question again. <laughs> what was our, oh, but it's, are we ready when we look around at our, our systems, our team? Oh yeah, are we ready, right? Okay, so are we ready? There we go, thank you very much. Um, so we're never going to be ready. Are you ever ready for anything? And, and, and are we ready sort of um, implies that there's a we. Well, is there a we? I, I don't know if there's a we, because even though we are all women, we are all very different women, very different experiences. So I don't think there's, there's a, a point where we can say, are we ready for, for that? I think, you know, we proceed at different, different rates and, and different speeds with regard to the diversity equity, inclusion, and influence that we have. And, and it's, it, you know, social science problems are never solved. They get to be solved over and over again as society changes, as people change. So that's my answer for that one. Who else has thoughts? I would just like to echo your words, Anna, because I'm with you. I think we're ready when we say we're ready. And when you look at the history of women's rights or other people's rights, it's never happened because people were quote unquote ready to go and everybody was on board. It's always been through the relentless use of proactive use of influence that change has been brought on. And I think the fact that, like you said, we're having this conversation, it means that we're ready for sure. We can't afford actually not to be having the conversation. I, I agree, it's not, we're beyond ready. Like we just need to move. I'm going to offer maybe a different perspective. <laughs> um, I, I don't know that we are ready yet. I think we are coming up to the tipping point of change. But, you know, I look at the ecosystem, what's happening. I look at some of the stats. For example, women's enrollment in computer science actually peaked in the 1980s, and it's been in a decline up until now, even though we have more women enrolling in post-secondary and in STEM programs. But computer science specifically stays very low. And while there's lots of grassroots energy, we're having lots of conversations at individual levels, um, you know, uh, community levels, but I think institutionally, we are likely not ready for change yet. And until we have companies that are fully bought in to doing the hard work, we are not going to see the types of change we are looking for. But maybe the optimistic line is that we are starting to see companies having those conversations. It's not perfect. They're not doing it in a way that they're not making mistakes or you know, they're not moving things backwards sometimes. But they are starting the conversation. They're trying to do the work. And I think that is an indicator that we are on the right path. But I don't think we're there yet. And I want to kind of follow up on that point because um, you know, women and marginalized folks face so many barriers once they're in any given industry. Um, but I think when we're looking at women in data science, those barriers start far beyond even getting into the industry in the first place. And so um, I'm curious to hear from your perspective, what needs to be done? Like what is that shift? What is happening? And what needs to be done in order to support that confident entry into data science, into computer science, um, for, I mean, you're talking, but we're talking about women specifically with this data, so, um, yeah, for women. Yeah, my, my response to that, Tommy, comes back to networks. So, I think role modeling is really key, and um, it's very important for women, especially other minorities, to see other people like them in those types of positions. And so, this is also a call that we can be role models at every stage of our careers. It's not like we reach, you know, senior director level title or we have 15 years under our belt and suddenly now I'm going to have the title of role model. You can be a role model in grade 12 to somebody who's in grade 9. You can be a role model in second year university, a new grad who's just gotten their foot in the door of their first company. There is somebody else along the same path who will learn and find value in the steps that you have taken. So this is a call for all of us to raise our hands and say, yes, I'm going to role model. I'm going to look for somebody else who might be on the same path, and I'm going to lend them a hand up to learn from my experiences so far. There's a lot of value in that. But the second piece around getting more women in data science specifically 
is how important it is to have peer networks. So a group of people where it is a safe place to share any challenges, fears, insecurities that will, that will move with you throughout your career and be a safe support network. If you don't have a peer network, I would say, you know, regardless of gender identity, that is something you should be looking to build for your career. Um, because your peers are the ones who will advocate for you. They will also open up doors. They'll create your more network. So role modeling, peer networks, and then mentorship. So the, those advisors around you who will give you the honest feedback and say, here's, you know, here's some improvements you could be making. Here's where that might not have worked. If you can build those things throughout your career, if we can step up for each other in those types of capacities, I think that is a really great way to start to get more women in the space. But it's also important that while we are investing in the attraction, that we are also building systems to retain the women that we do have as well. I would just like to build on what you said and say, in addition to those pieces, the sponsorship, and you talked earlier about who's talking about you increases your influence, and so um, male allies, allies more broadly, not just being role models and mentoring, but then actively speaking about and promoting and advancing their network of younger, upcoming, female diversity, equity seeking um, people is, is also a critical thing that can make a huge difference. And allyship can feel really broad. You're like, what does that mean? We hear that word a lot. But Sherry, you did a really great example in your comment right there. So when you jumped in and you said, I want to build off of this idea that I had, that is a great way to spotlight somebody for the, for the idea they've brought forward and to give credit where it's due. So that is a very small thing that anybody can do in a conversation, in a meeting, in an interview, um, to be an ally. So thank you, Sherry. The, um, the women who were in Barack Obama's inner circle had a harder time being heard. And so they developed what they called an echoes and allies strategy and they wrote in some of their male colleagues. And so when, when Mary would say something in a meeting, Sonia or Tom would say, oh, great point, Mary. Or if Sonia was not at the meeting, then Marshall would say, you know, Sonia really knows this stuff, we should consult her. And that is something that anybody can do. I, I love that, and I would love to hear from both Anna and Marianna about your perspective on what allyship looks like, like real time, or any experience that you've had of real practical allyship, because I, I love those, that's so great. I know I'm putting you both on the spot. Well, to me, to me, allyship sort of implies that there's someone out there or a group of people out there who require allies or need allies or could benefit from allies. So immediately to me, that, that, that uh, indicates a power differential. Um, and when we think about uh, hearing voices and, and amplifying voices and so on, I think it's so easy to forget that, that conflict and difference of opinion is part of that. And what I've certainly found coming back to Canada after having spent 20 years uh, in other countries and in other cultures ranging from Roma and Sinti to North, North European to, to Africa, I mean, I got around, you know. It was a real education for me coming from central Alberta. So when we talk about diversity, that means that, that by definition somebody's going to see something, experience something, define something, want something different than you do. So we're all people of, of influence here. I mean, otherwise you're not, you know, you wouldn't be here. You have, you have the power to influence in your spheres, as my, as my colleagues here were saying. So that means examining internally, I'm a psychologist, I'm gonna say this, examining in, internally, how do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with it when somebody says, I don't agree with you, or that's not my experience, or that's not what I want, or you know what, that's a dumb idea, right? How, how, how do you deal with that? Do you have a culture of conflict in, in your organization, in your team? How do you, how do you take it when someone has a, a, a different approach than you do? And I remember some years back, somebody got a hold of me on LinkedIn and asked me to, um, to work with them to develop a, a, a measurable way to, I don't even know how they phrase it, a measurable way to do culture. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, I, I, I got nothing to say about that. I mean, seriously. You know, culture, the culture of an organization. How many times did you hear in the past years, you know, we're going to hire for culture? What does that mean? It means you're going to hire people who are not going to argue with you. 
not going to push back. You know, what, 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 how can you possibly innovate if people aren't free? They don't have the psychological safety to say, you know what, I had a different experience. Maybe that's because I have a different country of origin. Maybe that's because I have a different sort of language base. Maybe it's because of my, my family of, of origin. There could be a thousand different reasons. A thousand different people, a thousand billion different reasons. So the, the core of this conversation, to me, is how do you personally embrace conflict, embrace other points of view, in order to harness that and grow your team? out on, or we're really missing out on the richness that can come from those conversations and also just from being with people who are different from us and being able to hold space um, with people who are different from us. So I want to move to a conversation about that a little bit because I think there is, and has often historically been, this refusal to meaningfully include marginalized folks. Um, whether through voices, whether through um, experience and all of these things. So um, in any industry, um, it doesn't just disadvantage the marginalized folks. It doesn't just advantage equity-seeking folks when we do this. It, it, it disadvantages everyone and it disadvantages these institutions that are so dead set on maintaining the status quo. So can we talk a little bit about what these institutions are missing out on um, when they push so hard to just maintain the status quo? What are the disadvantages of not embracing diversity? Or I should say, what are the benefits um, of embracing diversity? And I know you have a lot of thoughts yeah, on this. I'm, I'm dying to jump in here. You know, we so often have these con conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion as if they're about giving a hand up to people who are marginalized or targeted or whatever language you use. And the truth is that we have decades of data, three decades of data that makes so clear the benefits that flow from ensuring that you have diverse perspectives around the table. And that's unequivocal. There's no debating that anymore. And the, the concrete benefits that flow from ensuring that you're not all thinking the same way include Profitability, companies that include women at senior levels in the C-suite, on the board, they're more profitable. They're more profitable because they come up with better product ideas. They're, they're more effective at servicing their clients. Their customer relations are better because the diversity of perspectives around the table, the workplaces are happier, there's more ethical decision making. So it's so unequivocal and, and I actually think that shareholders should be marching in the streets or going to AGMs of publicly held corporations and saying, hello, where are the women? Where are the people of color? Where is the diversity informing that context? And let me just give you one really relevant, currently relevant, concrete example. So in 2008, it was not fate when mortgage lenders greed led with unprecedented speed to global financial collapse an alarming relapse, uh, like the Great Depression, feeding even more suppression of women's rights in France, the Minister of Finance was asked what could have been done to avoid the ton of damage from which only the wealthiest escaped, and she said, I must confess, if only Lehman Brothers had had a few sisters, we wouldn't be in this mess. She said that. Research backs her up. Scientific studies here and there show Hire more women, hire up, plenty are able, and worldwide financial markets would be more stable. So that, that's a research-supported conclusion, and what we know is that men, men and women, and you know, gender, like it's not a binary, we understand that the diversity of those perspectives, it's not that one is better, it's that when you bring them together, you get richer, more nuanced decisions. And what we know from research is that men are socialized and encouraged and rewarded for taking greater risks for short-term gain, and women are socialized and rewarded for considering consequences and long-term pain, because life trains us for that. And so when you put those two together, you simply get better outcomes on every level. Yeah, that's that mic drop moment. Amazing. So, um, okay, so 
everything you're saying, I'm like, yes, yes, it makes so much sense. I'm curious to know um, that approach of how we get there and that, that the best approach, because I know for me, and I'm probably not alone, I cringe when I hear the word quotas, because I'm like, nobody wants to feel like a token, or nobody wants to, um, you know, feel like the diversity hire and, and be questioned on their qualifications because everybody's aware that there's a quota in place. Um, but I know you've done a lot of research in the space, and um, so yeah, I'm curious to know what you've found, what the research says about quotas, and if that's something that you would like to see institutions implement. So quotas is a dirty word for sure. I get that there's a knee-jerk rejection of the notion that you would hire a woman or a black person simply because they were female or black. And so partly we need to disabuse that whole notion by sharing the research that we've just talked about. But there's a lot of research, and you talked about your experience, Anna, in Europe. Uh, let me just ask the audience this question. I'm curious to know where do you think Canada ranks internationally in terms of women's representation in politics? Are we 10th? Are we 20th? Are we 30th? Does anybody have a guess? Just mentally imagine where you think we are, because Canada, we think we're doing pretty well. The truth is we're 61st. 61st. That's because five dozen other countries have many of them used quotas at the political level to ensure that women have representation in the halls of power because democracy depends on representation. Like that's a basic thing we all understand. And so when you look at the quota research, and there's been a lot of it around the world in countries where this has been done, in Norway, in the UK, in India, in Sweden, they implemented gender quotas at the municipal level in elections. And then they went in after the elections and researchers independent of the political parties and systems evaluated the quality of the candidates or the now elected officials and their ability to perform their jobs. And they concluded that after gender quotas, the quality of, of elected officials improved. Because what happened was parties, when they were recruiting candidates, wanted the best candidates possible. And so what they did was they en ended up eliminating the men who were okay but not as stellar as the few women who were willing to stand up and say, yes, I know I will be held to a higher standard of authority because I wa I'm a woman. I know I will be criticized for my appearance and my mothering, but I'm willing to do it anyway because I think I have something to add. And so in study after study and in the business sector as well, it's really clear that when there's an imposition of quotas and people have to work harder to cast their net wider to ensure that they have a diversity of representation around the table, the decision making improves and all of the other things that I've just talked about, the research makes clear. Do you know what? Angela Merkel, the, uh, the Chancellor, former Chancellor of Germany, right? So she's taking over after, uh, after Helmut Kohl, who was a big man and a big figure in Germany. And, and, and so to have a woman, never mind a woman scientist, never mind a woman scientist from, from, from East Germany, you know, oh, wow, this was, this was radical. And, and, and who the hell does she think she is anyway? You know, she was so qualified. She, she had been tutored by him and mentored by him over decades, her entire career, never mind her academic qualifications, blah, blah, blah. She didn't have the right haircut. <laughs> After she went and fixed her hair, then the German public said, well, all right then. I, I, I don't dispute your example at all, but I also think it's um, really important to appreciate that the research also shows in the political arena that women are as, as likely to be elected as their male colleagues. And so even though women are held to a higher standard of authority around our appearance, our credentials, just think of Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, what the, even though that's the case, we are as likely to be elected. And so people's attitudes, notwithstanding, you know, some notable examples, the truth is most people intuitively understand and appreciate that there are a lot of smart women, smart people of color, like we don't have a lock, us white and male and middle-aged 
Yeah, people understand that. Okay, I feel like there's just been so, so much good content. So I wanna take a bit of a break and see if anyone has any questions for our panelists. Yes, I love it. How, uh, how's your voice feeling? Do you want me to bring you a mic or are you a projector? I, I think they're already trying. So. Oh, <laughs> perfect. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, wonderful conversation. Um, a lot of the talk had so far has been about diversity on the work floor, diversity in decision-making positions, management positions. But an inherent problem in data science itself is that there is something called algorithmic bias, where we have a lot of bias in historic data sets that are currently being used on the, on the fringe of data science, of machine learning, artificial intelligence, where historic data sets are being used in order to evaluate performance of models. Time and time again, research has shown in different industries from uh, algorithms predicting people whether they should receive a loan, uh, algorithms predicting people according in, in specific law circumstances, and recently with self-driving cars as well, well, algorithms have shown that they are less accurate for people with different skin colors. Now, a thing to solve this is, of course, we can collect more data from minority groups. But the problem with minority groups is that there are minorities. It's, it's much harder to collect data from minority groups. So my, my question is, because this is not a, a problem of just collecting more data. This is a problem of how we're going to solve um, correct predictions for minority groups in these kind of like life-defining uh, algorithms that, that change a person's life. So I, I just wanted to steer the conversation maybe a little bit towards that and maybe ask some opinions and then some advice maybe on like how large companies that are constructing these kind of data sets, what kind of efforts that they can do uh, in order to, to improve performance for minority groups. That's a, that's a great question and I love the nuance of it, so thank you. Um, I think that we need to be investing resources to build those data sets. Equity, diversity, and inclusion work is not an easy path to walk. It should be hard, it should cost money, it should be uncomfortable. And if it is not those things, then we're likely not doing it right. So there is this commitment from our institutions to be investing in that. I would say, you know, the self-driving car example, that data set also comes, let's use that as an example, with a lot of other social um, intersectionality so it's not only minorities who are driving, who are maybe, yeah, driving self-driving cars, but also who has access to. So it becomes a wealth issue, right? And so is it up to the company to solve the wealth issue? There's a lot of things that become related and it becomes quite complex. Um, I don't have the answer to that, but I do think that companies can do more in investing in building out more diverse data sets and seeking them out. We know from a hiring perspective that companies are starting to invest more to reach diverse talent groups, and it should be the same thing to ensure that data sets are also diverse. That's a great point. And also from a different angle, as being somebody who is in the weeds of data every day, I don't know if it's because I am a woman and other, but even in the things that I'm building, I think, what are the biases in this? And you know, as a data scientist, you have to make assumptions sometimes, and things are gray. Unfortunately, not always black and white, and you have to make compromises with data. But I think recognizing where you inherently know there is not the data is not right. I've heard time and time again, and even Ben, the director of the society, brought an example yesterday in a chat, and was talking about how this company had invested about a million dollars in trying to get rid of bias in the software they were building. Um, and then they figured at the end that there was still gender bias in their set and they just called it quits. So I think, as you mentioned, it is having that raw honesty and saying, you know what, like this is not right and this is what we're gonna call it. Um, this also reminds me of a book called Weapons of Math, Des Math Destruction. I don't know if anybody else has read it, but it also talks about the existing systems in education uh, in imprisonment, like jails and prisons, of how there is already bias within that and how that affects all of us. So it's not only new systems that already need revolutionizing, but it's 
what we've already built, how can we improve upon it? And even within the first few iterations, we're not gonna, it's not gonna be perfect and we need to keep coming back to it and ensure that those biases are completely removed. And I think this is where we rely on the talent and the diversity, the neurodiversity of women, men, and other genders to say, how do we solve for this? We need all the smart people, all the people in the room to truly think through that. And I am definitely not that person, so I'm going to rely on those people to come up with a solution. So there was this guy, and uh, he's got a consulting business. And uh, I went to see him one day, he's a you know, friend of mine. And uh, I said, well, you know, what's, what's been going on? What's, what's new with you? And he's talking about his new venture and how he's got you know, his, his, his uh, people together and they were gonna collaborate on this new project. And I said, well, awesome. And I'm looking at their pictures, you know, it's like our, our pictures here. And I'm saying, well, geez, you know, Fred, um, you, don't, you don't have very much diversity here. He says, what are you talking about? I got a, I got a guy from banking. Uh, you know, I got a guy from IT. I got a guy, you know, he's going like this, and they, they were all, this guy, you know, white guy, middle aged, bald, and they all looked like him. You know, that that was diversity for him, right? You know, and I just thought, geez, like, how can we even have a conversation about what that means? Point number one. Point number two. When we think about leadership, quite often what we're thinking about is finding an answer, knowing the way, having a vision, guiding through a path. Too little do we talk about asking the right questions, right? So, I mean, who are these minority groups that, 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 that you know, I'm not picking on you, okay? Um, but who are these minority groups that we're talking about? Minority means there's a majority. If there's a majority, why is that? I mean, if you, if you, don't, have enough, if you don't have enough women, it's not like there's a scarcity of women. You know, if you, don't, if you don't have enough people who are non-English speakers, it's not like there's not enough people who don't speak English. The problem is, as, as you were talking about before, is not only the hiring and the retention, but going way back before that into how do we treat our, our, our children? How do we encourage our children? How do we, how do we um, educate them in ways that encourage their own diversity of thinking so that when they reach positions of power, they ask good questions? If I can quickly comment on that, just to just to maybe clear it up, what I meant is that with a lot of the model performance, no, it's fine, it's fine. It's a very valid point. With a lot of the model performances, they give accuracies, they give scores to these kind of models. And my question is, with these kind of models, even though it might seem on paper to perform really, really well, if, for example, in that one percentage is an overrepresentation of a group that is considered to be a minority. For example, in the self-driving car example, the issue there is that self-driving cars are not recognizing people uh, of a different skin color as well as they do for people with a whiter skin color. And I think those kind of issues in, in, in algorithms and in, in data science are things that we should put a lot of resources and time in in order to resolve that because this is not just a quota anymore. This is something that is very crucial for, for people's lives. And that's tough because likely the company wants to move things forward. They don't want to get stuck on there's an, integri there's an integrity issue in our data. We want to just push out this product so we can make more money. That is the flow of the company. So the fact that you're asking the question is step one. And we all need to have that mindset to be able to look at the data and be asking those kinds of questions. But the second step is to actually keep asking those questions because it is in the company's nature, most like large companies, to want to quiet those voices so that it can keep moving towards progress and revenue. And so I think for everybody in this room, we need to, to keep asking those questions. And that will be hard. That will be very uncomfortable. It will create conflict. And you know, you will continue to be a minority voice, but that is what advocacy, allyship, and influence is all about. So thank you for those questions. So it's such a good question. Any other questions? Um, okay, um, such a great conversation. I learned a lot from the conversation and everyone sitting here. 
Um, so I have a question more like in the bullet item. I look at working for like an actionable items. So I, my background has been working for three years. I graduated during the pandemic in 2020, and I have been working as a data scientist for the last three years. And two thirds, more than two thirds of that time, I have been working in a team that I'm the only women in the team. So my question would be how would someone like me to help my company hire more women in tech? Just like someone like me, a junior, there's no like hiring power in me or anything like that. Thanks. So there was this, this company that uh, after the, the, the murder of George Floyd, um, they, they went into a panic and they said, well, we have to be seen to be doing something. <laughs> that should have been the first clue. We have to be seen to be doing something. And, uh, and so they approached me and they asked me to do a coast to coast to coast research project to, to figure out how were they doing in, in terms of, of, of diversity. And, um, you know, they, they had their answers, but, but what they really wanted was to be seen to be doing something. So referring back to something, I think everybody here has, has, has touched on that before. The, with the change that you want to see, whatever it is, if, it, if it's hiring more women or perhaps uh, hiring, hiring more not neurodivergent people, what, whatever it is that, that speaks to your heart, uh, you can be the change. So you can suggest, for example, uh, to, to form a, a committee, however you want to phrase that, suggest that some research gets done, pilot that research yourself. And most importantly, and this is, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, is mentorship. So I'm in the process right now of, of founding a, a new nonprofit based on work that I've been doing the last three years on mentorship. And that is, how do you cultivate uh, leadership in people so that they, they continue to, to give, right? It's not like, oh, I, I got what I want, I'm good to go, well, thank, you know, thanks for that, I'm, I'm, I'm done. But to continue on that pathway of leadership and continue to ask questions as you go forward. So is there a question that you ask? Do you have a safe enough psychological space in your company to be able to ask the question and say, you know, I have an idea, but it's probably going to be something that, that, that is new for the company, but I'm willing to put some muscle behind it because everybody's got great ideas, right? It's the difference between sort of, uh, you know, uh, inspiration and perspiration. Are you willing to put the work behind it in order to make it happen? So I think we can, you know, we can put forward ideas to our company and, and work through those ideas with a bit of perspiration to show the benefit. Why does this matter? Why does this matter now? How is it going to benefit the company? Especially when we're working on ideas like minimum viable product, you know, get it, get it out the door, right? It's not that long-term thinking. It's, it's not necessarily thinking in divergent ways that are going to take us away from the path. So if you can show from a more of a, a heuristic point of view what that benefit is, why you're saying that, uh, I, I think you know there's all kinds of scope for you to do that and and maybe start a mentorship program in your company. Having been many times in a position like yourself, Ju, I think for me, something that has been really key to be able to move forward has been that radical way of driving influence, even if it's for myself and being self-motivated, but not even just on your own, right? Because we said it's a team sport. So having a network that I can rely on to stay encouraged and to say, you know what, this is stuff, I am the only woman, I get put down for it or whatever the case may be and say, and still I'm gonna stick with it until I have, my influence is gonna evolve and it's gonna expand. And once I'm in a position where I get to have a say in the hiring, then I get to make the decision. But until then, it's influencing the people around you men and women to say, how can we, we be more inclusive? Or, hey, you think things differently than I do, but what about this and what about that? So just approaching it in every way that you can attack it and just be reassured that you are doing the right thing by women. If I can just build off of what you're saying, Mariana, I also think it's important before you act to maybe ask a few more questions. Um, so I'd be looking at questions like, is this really a priority at my company? And are they actually, do they actually want to hire more women or is this just important to me as an individual working here? The second question would be, is there a leadership who would actually get behind this to help me move this forward? Or am I going to be the only one championing that? 
Because if the answer is no to both of those questions, I think this is to that point of, are we ready? The answer is probably no. So the amount of change that you're going to enact for the amount of effort you put in is going to be low, unfortunately. And then so the question goes back to you as an individual of, do I want to ch make change within my company or do I need to build something to keep me engaged in my career? Do I need a, a solution for me? And if it's the latter, then you can start looking externally to other types of groups and resources that might actually meet your needs. I agree completely with you and I've been in situations where even I, if I have the research, I've been held back and saying, and still it doesn't matter that there is no equality and you have the research to back it up we're still not gonna give what you're looking for. And that is where I say, okay, how can I voice my experience? Does this have a name, what I'm going through? And then going outside of that. But at the same time, even if you recognize the answer is no for your questions, that you still have to use your influence and raise your voice. I think it is still important and impactful whether or not change ends up happening in the policies themselves in an organization really, really helpful advice. Thank you so much. I saw another hand. I just want to like uh, follow up on the, the question, the first question, the question, the answer to the first question is yes. I actually asked my VP of engineer, I asked him like, how can we hire more women? And he asked me, what do you think what we should do? And then I was like, oh, I haven't thought about that question <laughs> yet. <laughs> so that's why I was like thinking about this since the last time I asked him, but like, thank you so much for the answers. Yeah, that's very inspiring. Thank you. Uh, you know, myself, I'm a male. I have a wife, uh, two daughters. This is a topic that is uh, particularly important to me. Uh, in concern of this, like, how do I go about talking and trying to action to change a system that's so invisible to many people, with obviously without feeling disingenuous? I obviously don't have some of these lived experiences that others will will face. Yeah, that's it. Great question. I, I would say one of the ways is to be. I mean, the very fact that you're here. <clears throat> and you're asking the question means that you're already thinking about it and then just in your daily workplace to be consciously surfacing that and viewing what's going on around you with that frame of reference and looking for ways to make space for the other half of the human race for you know just encouraging women to speak up to mentor to sponsor um, to Imagine your partner or your daughter in the space, hearing the conversation, the way it's evolving, and, and channeling, well, wow, what would she feel or think about this is more likely to allow you to surface objections or counter perspectives, or even say, you know, we really need to involve some women or some black people or indigenous people in this conversation. Just, yeah, all of, all of those suggestions. And, and from from a from a psychology point of view, you know, be a good dad. And you being here right now is being a good dad. Show your daughters the way. Show your daughters the way that a man acts in different situations. Encourage them to find a voice and 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 try things out and and be be wrong sometimes. And 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 allow them to explore their personalities and show other dads what that looks like. I mean, you can model away. I think it's also about being a little bit more anticipatory of everybody's needs around you. And that can be as a parent, a partner, a friend, a colleague. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples, um, maybe a personal one. So my husband is really good at driving uh, and he loves to drive. And so he'll always say, hey, I'm going to go to the grocery store. What do you need? But then it puts the energy on me to think about, okay, what are we needing? What are we missing in the fridge? What do we need to cook? What, do, what else do we need? So that there's actually, he's putting a big mental load on me, even though he's doing the effort of actually going to pick up the groceries, which is super helpful. So something that would actually be more helpful is for him to say, hey, I'm going to the grocery store. I think we need X, Y, and Z. Is there anything I might be missing? I'd be like, no, that's awesome. Thank you so much. It's that little extra step of being anticipatory. And so how do we bring that mindset into the way we show up for people at work? 
Uh, it could be as simple as an email where you might be looking for a file. Hey, um, Tommy, where is this file that I need for this project? And a better version of that might be, hey, Tommy, I'm looking for this file. I've checked these places. Can you help me find where it actually is? Or, you know, to show that you've actually done the work. And that little piece of that step up, that extra effort, that's the cost of being an ally. Because being an ally, you don't get to just show up and it doesn't cost you anything. There does need to be something that you are putting on the table to help the people around you. And we need to get comfortable with that, um, recognizing that the cost associated to it. Lastly, in addition to build up on what you're saying, I think in, in being anticipatory, there's also giving trust to take a risk. To me, that's been so important in building myself up to say, I can give this a try by other mentors who are men and to say, Mariana, I trust you to take up this space. I trust you to go for this. You got this. Don't look at me for answers. Just go for it. And yeah, fail, make mistakes, and that's okay. And I think with bringing up young women and even within your workspace, that's super key and women would really appreciate that. I love that. Okay, I'm seeing two other hands. Uh, thank you guys for the wonderful conversation. I just want to add a few things because as an instructor, I see in my class, I have a couple of girls and like it's a male dominating class. And in the classroom, uh, all the girls, they do well, like, you know, their grades are good, they, their work ethics are good, but uh, when you go to the industry level, we don't have that. Like, those, uh, I mean, you know, there is the, obviously there is a gender difference, but um, I, I don't, I think, like, you know, the, the females or uh, the, the, uh, the minority who is working hard, they don't make it to that level so they can, when they go for a job, they, they cannot compete in that world. So, yeah. Uh, what you thought about it? So are, are you asking about what happens in the gap between school and career? What happens to the girls? Um, from, from my point of view, um, when girls leave school and, and go into the workforce, they have a different experience than boys who leave school and go into the, to the workforce. If I think about the, the resources and energy and the hopes and dreams sometimes of entire families that go around getting that boy through school, getting that boy through university, getting that boy earning sometimes to support larger families, mm -hmm. compared to what the girl's role is. Her role is no less important, but she's there in a, a caring capacity, helping look after family, perhaps looking after aging parents or aging grandparents or other kinds of caregiving roles, looking after sister's baby, and maybe she's studying too, but she's damn tired. And because of gender disparities, the boy, he gets his dinner cooked for him. I'm just, I'm just exaggerating the hell out of this guy. Okay, don't jump on me. But I mean, you know, he'll get his dinner cooked. He'll get his, his dishes washed up for him. And he'll have all kinds of quiet time and a dedicated space in order to get him through university. And, 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 and you know, mentoring through dad and uncle and, and, and whoever to, to, to get him through because the family's depending on him. Right? So they're, you know, depending on the, on, the, on, on the type of family that people are from, that could be an issue. Canada is also a country of, of, of immigration. You know, I think I could say everybody in this room is, is an immigrant, unless you were, you know, an indigenous person. We are all immigrants here. So we have that immigrant experience about trying to make it. And, 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 and notions of, 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 you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're still not paid the same as men. So are you going to put your money on your daughter or are you going to put your money on your son if it comes down to that? Can you afford to send two kids through? Which one are you going to pick? Well, she's going to get married anyway, you know. There, there, there's still these cultural biases that come through that are still very, very much present when you talk about people who've given up everything to come from country of origin and come here and try and make it. They're still in a game of, you know, horse racing, you know, who, who's, who's going to make it through the gate? 
So uh, this is this is a, this is a real thing. When when you're talking about more established families, don't think that that gender bias isn't still there. You go into any department store, you're going to see things still separated by girls and boys. And we all know from psychology there are cognitive differences between boys and girls. There are social differences between boys and girls. I'm not trying to say they're the same. Clearly they're not. But how do we deal with those differences and how do we welcome those differences into our classrooms, into our families, and into, into the corporate setting? I, I would also say that um, for young women going into workplaces that are predominantly or sometimes overwhelmingly male, even if they come out with the work ethic and the grades and the abilities, being in a daily environment, and I'm sure you can all speak to this, being in a daily environment that was built by and for people who are not like you, who do not have your lived experience, and the systems and the structures and the daily conversation reminds you every minute of every day, I don't really belong here, I don't really fit in here, is a way to really crush your spirit. And so I think that's why it's incumbent on companies to be really soul-searching and looking for things they can do in the workplace on the retention front. And it's their responsibility, as has been said, it's not enough to recruit young women, people of color, you actually have to look at the systemic environment you're bringing them into and, and get advice from those people about what will make you feel more welcome, accepted, heard in this, in this environment. I think we often forget the mental gymnastics required to navigate a space and a system that wasn't designed for you. And so even though like there might be, we might not see those obvious barriers, like we might say, like, oh, well, people are enrolling, um, and just there's just a random gap and a random drop off, like why is this happening? I feel like the, there, it just, there's so much intention required at every step to even, I mean, get someone through the day, much less through a career. Um, so I think it goes back to so many of your comments um, that we've heard from our panel of um, the mentorship, the community, that those networks and that support. Actually, I just want to build up on her question. Being a student myself, um, I actually thought that before, I was thinking that it's like a general mindset with everybody that when you're just going searching for a job just out of school, um, everybody feels like, you know, I, I'm doubting myself. Like, for example, I do have industry experience before. My education is basically my upgradation. But this just fear inside me, that inherent fear, oh, maybe I'm not that good for this job because I just finished school. But with my male counterparts, it's not like that. Oh, I did that two, three years ago as well. And I think I did that too. I can probably apply for this job. But I feel looking at the job, knowing very well, oh, I might be a better can candidate, but just lacking that confidence inside that, oh, maybe I don't have all of this because I just finished school. I think I'm just adding on what she said that it is an in, I, I don't know how to bring that change of mindset inside me that no I'm good enough for this I need to jump into it. I'm pretty sure no one on our panel has ever experienced imposter syndrome. <laughs> um, so what do we do about it? What do uh, what are what are we doing about imposter syndrome? Well, my default would be to go back to the answer that I just gave and that is to remind ourselves whatever the source of your imposter syndrome is, is that it's not about you. It's so not about us as individuals, it's about the system that was designed and built and is operating for uh, people who are not like us. And so just that reminder. The other practical thing I've done for 20 years is, is create a positive feedback document which sits on my computer and every time somebody gives me by email or verbally positive feedback, that was great, you did a good job, I write that down or I copy and paste. The file is now 65 pages long. And I don't go to it except to add stuff to it. But it's a positive reinforcement. I know it's there and it helps to override the inner voice in my head that says, you don't know what you're doing, which is, yeah. 
You know, these are great questions because a lot of these questions being asked in the audience today are actually alluding to some of the systemic challenges that we also face. So we experience them on an individual level, but they are leading us to these larger issues that we also need to be picking up and looking at. And so that fear, that insecurity around, will I be able to do this, that imposter syndrome, which we do all experience at many stages in our careers, not just at the beginning. Actually, there is some data around it that women are often judged on their past work performance. So you're evaluated for your promotion based on what you've already demonstrated, whereas men are often evaluated on their potential. So there is some grounding in that fear, that insecurity of, can I do this? Uh, but to Sherry's point, I also have a document like that, so it's a tool that works. Um, and again, I think, find your peers, those people that around you that you can go to, men or women, and say, hey, I'm really feeling insecure about this. Can you help me navigate this? Is this all in my head, or is there something I can be improving here? That will be a great tool as you go through the rest of your career as well. One other thing I would just add in, and that is an invitation to behave like, to give yourself permission to behave like a reasonable white man. <laughs> I happen to be married to a reasonable white man who is empowered to do stuff all the time that I would hesitate. And so I try and channel my husband and think, well, he would say, you're asking my opinion, of course I'm going to give it. And so I just need to shut that down and behave like a reasonable, not an asshole, a reasonable <laughs> white man. I love that. Oh my God, these are great points. And honestly, I think the, the main one is the document. I have an inbox and also I save things to my phone uh, when I get positive feedback. But for me, it's also the other way around. And for all the great mentors that I've had, I think, how can I give them their flowers? How can I say, because they experience imposter syndrome too, as much as they're saying, hey, you're great, good job going for this opportunity. I'm sure because I've done that. So it's really nice to also hear from the people that you've been impacted or that you've impacted and the other way around. And I think you can never do enough of that. And again, the support system, for sure. I texted Tommy the other day and I was like, hey, I'm having imposter syndrome about this panel. What should I tell? <laughs> And there you go, here we are today. They didn't run away. Love that. Okay, you guys ask so much better questions than I do. So now I'm having imposter syndrome. Um, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, but yeah, let's, I think I saw a few more hands. Oh. Oh. Thank you for discussing such an important topic. Um, there's a movement right now, a little bit, of in order to promote, to promote equality, and reduce racism and sexism, that you should view all people as equal. Like, not see the differences between people, their colors of skin, their culture, um, or their sex. To me, that causes more harm, and you don't recognize the privilege that some groups ha have, and how much harder some groups have to work. So I was just curious what your thoughts were. Yeah, I would totally support your analysis of that. Um, there's a really great documentary that you can watch for free online called Deconstructing Karen. And I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but I think every white person in the world should watch this documentary uh, because it gets at exactly that question that you're raising. The truth is, we, we are very visual creatures, and we notice those differences, and because those differences between human beings have a marked impact on the life, the life experience of women, of people of color, of indigenous people, of trans people. There's no pretending that we're all the same. That's just flat out bullshit wrong. And becoming, and I, this is an a encouragement to white people, because we are the ones who have been walking around with invisible privilege, thinking that we are where we are because we have worked hard and we're smart, and those also may be true, but on top of that, we have a level of ease in the world that we really mostly don't know. Thank you for the question. I went, uh, I went to a small village in, in Africa, and I mean, obviously, I'm the only white person there, and uh, the food was brought, the goats were brought, the chickens were brought, and I was elected queen mother 
you know, and and I I said no, I'm 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 not doing this, you know, I'm I, I can't be queen mother just because I'm white, you know what's going on, and I, I didn't realize I think until a couple of years later that that was the wrong answer too, because the the systemic racism was so deep that what I was doing was dishonoring them, like they finally got their chance at having a white queen mother and I'm turning them down. You know, so 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 these 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 systems and these structures and these beliefs are, are are so deep sometimes that what feels like liberation can be imprisonment. So I would encourage everyone here to take good care of one word, and that's the word should. Because the should is nothing that's coming from your inside and your real belief system. It's coming from our super egos, and that's the internalized parents. The internalized father, the internalized mother, the internalized society that tells us what we should or shouldn't be doing. And in, in each person is different. I mean, it, it's, it's easier to look at, okay, possibly, I don't know, male or female, or possibly skin color. Near, you know, diversity is, is, is huge and, and takes many different forms. So you never know what kind, of, what kind of family of origin experience did that person have, you know? It can be very, very different. So as, as, as soon as we start getting into should, and some of these, some of these, I don't know what you guys feel about this. These these memes that go around, you know, whether it's on LinkedIn or, or, or somewhere else, you know, these like top ten ways to whatever, telling people what we should do, how we should be as leaders, how we should show empathy. You talk to any neurodivergent person, any person on the autism, and none of that stuff applies. And then you go into the boardroom and you got these ten things up on the, on, the, on the slide about how we should behave with one another, and you're just excluding a whole bunch of people. So, I mean, you're never going to be able to make things right for everybody. But getting back to, I think, what's been a common theme for all of us is that asking questions, you know, leadership is, is, is really about finding out where, where are you starting from. Because what might be good advice, that for sure, in mentorship, you can see that person, you know, this would be a good thing for you to do. You should, oh, there's the word, shouldn't. You've got to ask the questions because that person might not be ready. You've got to pick people up where they are and you've got to recognize where you are in your evolution because we are all in the process of becoming as we, as we age, as we go through our careers. We're at different stages of readiness, speaking of, speaking of are we ready, different stages of readiness to absorb certain kinds of information or to act in certain ways in, in the world. So I, I think it really gets back to, to those questions. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Perfect. See you right over here. Thank you so much for the conversation, it's been amazing. Um, kind of going back to the integration of women in technology. So recently I was an ambassador for my school and we did, I was with this company called CDL and they basically teach about different startups and different future technologies. And as I was managing this, I realized that all of the girls in my class, in my grade, my peers, they did not pick any of the technology-related um, things. They didn't pick IA, or they didn't pick AI. They didn't pick fintech. They didn't pick digital society or computational health. And I, it got me thinking because I'm really interested in this kind of thing. And it got me thinking: um, How can we change the way we educate girls, and how can we change our education system in a way that? we can get young people like me interested in these fields and like broaden the horizons for us because I'm pretty sure most of my friends would absolutely love these industries if they actually knew about it. So what are some ways we can integrate these new education, these new technologies into education? This doesn't come from my personal experience, but I have read analyses suggesting that um, and this also may be a generalization, but that one of the things that stops women from entering science, for example, is not seeing the direct women, young women, girls will say, I really want to work with people. 
And so they're not seeing how their, their desire to work with or help people and make the world better is manifest or available in the sectors or the fields that you've talked about. And of course, there are huge opportunities to make the world better or improve human beings' lives in tech, in data, in AI. And so from an educational perspective or from a mentoring sponsorship piece, it's making the connection between the capacity of these tech fields to make an impact on other human beings' lives. So making that really clear and allowing the meaning part of it as opposed to only the tech part of it come to the fore. Yeah, so systemically, you know, focusing on the impact of the technology instead of the technology itself. Because tech is a means to an end. We can use any kinds, all sorts of tech to get to the end result. But we need to focus on the end result, the impact of that work. It's about changing healthcare to be more holistic and actually care about the individuals that we are serving as patients. When we focus on that, not that we're using AI to get there, that becomes a lot more interesting to women and girls especially. And I think too, one of Mariana's points earlier, um, you know, not only, not only focusing on the end result, because especially in girls, I think that creates this perfectionist mindset, uh, which can be really debilitating as we get into our later careers. But to focus on setting process goals. So we're gonna work on this project to build a castle. And it's not about building the best castle. It's about finding the most ways for the castle to break so we can learn the most lessons from that. Okay, let's set that as our goal. And how does that start to change the learning and exploration journey for girls going into STEM? I feel like there's, I mean, really hearing this theme of coming back to kind of seeing and being able to have that vision. And um, whether it's through people, through mentors, or through the way that we understand process or the way that we understand the impact of these fields. Um, but just how do, we, how do we talk about these things and how do we kind of reframe to better address um, the, the narratives that, that young women have been told for so long? Um, I love that. So thank you so much for all of your questions. That was so, so great. And I want to end um, with one final question because we've explored so much today. And I think, um, I'm sure a lot of people are leaving feeling a little inspired and, and fired up and really ready to kind of use your voice and ask these questions. And, and we've explored curiosity and, and all of these really important facets. But I think that advocacy when you're advocating for yourself or when you're advocating on behalf of others um, can often feel very intimidating. Um, using your voice can, I, I know it can feel very scary because you don't always have the precise language or you don't always have that stat um, or that receipt to kind of say this is what's going on, this is the problem. And so as people leave here today, I would love um, if you all can offer some insights on the best ways to kind of advocate for yourself or the best ways to express curiosity, ask those questions and speak up when you might not have a ton of language um, to describe some of the really complex systemic issues that you're experiencing um, because we know that discrimination can be very nuanced, it can be very subtle. Um, and so how do people leave here today and be advocates um, for themselves, for their community, um, if they don't have all the, the research, if they don't have all the language. You want a second to say? Yes, please. Okay, yes. Yeah. So I had a teacher in Lethbridge give me this suggestion recently when I was there speaking at a conference, and she said that the advice that I have thought about so much since is I notice and I wonder. So coming from your own lived experience, what you perceive, you're in an environment where something doesn't feel right, just starting with, I notice X, observation of what's going on, and then the question, I wonder if there's a different way we could do this, or if this has ever been a problem for somebody else. And that's a starting place. And then the second thing I would say is that Informed Opinions, the organization I lead, has a ton of free online resources specifically about becoming a more effective communicator, advocate, and so you're welcome to check that.
notice and I wonder. I love that. That's so good. Something that's been really helpful for me and not having the maybe the proper language to name an experience has been just talking about it with someone else and then hearing, oh, me too, and then a million me too's and thinking, oh, okay, this is a thing. Let's discuss how are you approaching it? How does your experience vary from mine? And then that is such an empowering thing of allyship and influence to move forward and saying, it's okay, I will be confident in taking this space and raising my voice and enacting influence with other people. Uh, can I just get a show of hands? Who's currently working in a company right now? Okay, and awesome, okay. Um, so I, I would say for folks, um, if you're working and you've got a professional development budget, Use some of that for continuing your education in this equity, diversity, and inclusion space. It could be around gender equity, anti-racism, but keep yourself educated. You've got the tools to do that. It's a really good step. I don't know, famous last words. <laughs> you know, like when you're, when you're, when you're in a situation, uh, it's, it's kind of too late because then you're in reactive mode. Like how, how do I respond to a perceived slight or how do I respond to sort of a continued barrage of, of, of whatever is coming? It, it's too late then. So if I could, you know, give a piece of advice, it would be um, to, to stay self-centered. So that doesn't mean being self-centered like being selfish. What it means is being centered in yourself. And you can only do that in, in terms of preparedness. Because by the, by the time, you know, you're, you're responding to something, you're, it's probably not going to come out well. So, you know, in, in, if you're in a situation where, where you, you feel you need to respond, sometimes the best thing, again, is a question. Why would you ask me something like that? Why would you say that? And a lot of communication, you've heard the numbers, 70%, 80%, whatever, is, is, is non-verbal. Non it's still true for online communication, right? So it's not so matter what you say or what the actual words are when you respond, although why would you ask that or why would you say that and then not expect an answer. Don't expect to continue the conversation because that response is good enough. But even online, your body language can communicate a lot, which is, are you uptight about that? You know, why would you say something like that to me, right? That's different than, why would you even ask me that? And next. Ah, oh, I love that. I love that. Um, so many amazing insights. I cannot thank our panelists enough. I've so enjoyed talking to all of you. And thank you so much, all of you, for participating in this conversation with us. This has been so great. If you'll join me in um, thanking our panelists.